we live, we love, we serve. Called to live, commanded to love, and commissioned to serve. And here at FCBC, how do we say it, family? We live, we love, we serve. Okay, I'm going to try this sermon again. Uh, that that uh, uh, we tried on last week, but I thank God for last week's worship experience. You know, people were messaging me, and, I, and I, I'm going to tell you, I've been here now 19 years. That has happened maybe five times or so over the years. But in those moments, I've been doing this long enough to know when you yield to the Spirit and you let the Spirit have its way in this place. And it was necessary um, in this space last week. So we praise God for the move of God. Thank God for our worship team this week. Uh, Brother Dante. Second Kings, the seventh chapter. 2 Kings 7, verses 3 through 9. 2 Kings 7, 3 through 9. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. Here's how it reads. <clears throat> now there were four leprous men outside the city gate who said to one another, Why should we sit here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city... The famine is in the city, and we shall die there. But if we sit here, we shall also die. Therefore, let us desert to the Aramean camp. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So they rose at twilight to go to the Aramean camp. But when they came to the edge of the Aramean camp, there was no one there at all. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, the king of Israel has hired the king of the Hittites and the king of Egypt to fight against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses and their donkeys, leaving the camp just as it was and fled for their lives. When these leprous men had come to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent, ate and drank, carried off silver, gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back, entered another tent, carried off things from it and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, what we are doing is wrong. This is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, we will be found guilty. Therefore, let us go and tell the king's household. Good. Let's pray, family. God, we thank you and we honor you on this day. And we are grateful, O oh God, for how you continue to move in this place and in this space. Have your way on today, O oh God. Have your way on today. Let your word move in a powerful way and touch and reach the spaces and places that it needs to today. So that, O oh God, you will get the glory. God, we thank you. We love you. And we honor you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Remain standing with me. Allow me to read just a portion, verses 3 and 4 of Second Kings 7. Now there were four leprous men outside the city gate who said to one another, Why should we sit here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. But if we sit here, we shall also die. Therefore, let us desert to the Aramean camp. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Amen. We're going to try it again. Do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and simply tell them, neighbor, take a chance and live. Come on, turn to your other neighbor. Tell them the same thing. Neighbor, take a chance and live. Come on now, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap. A praise on today. Take a chance and live. If you read the context of this narrative, it is quite alarming. The northern kingdom of Israel, led by King Joram, is under siege by the Aramean army. The Aramean army vastly outnumbers the army of Israel. And in fact, 
in their siege of Israel's capital, Samaria, they surrounded the city with a several legions of soldiers so that no imports could come into the city and nothing could leave the city. They did this until, and it was their plan, a famine would enter Samaria. No food would come in and they knew that instead of simply destroying the city, they would starve the people to death. This was their strategy to create a famine that would slowly kill the people in Samaria. In fact, it was so bad and the famine got so dire and resources were so limited that the scripture says that the people in Samaria turned to cannibalism. Even before that moment, they, they found themselves so desperate for food that the scripture says that, that, that a donkey's head sold for two pounds of silver. And the feces from a dove sold for a pound. That's how desperate to eat the people were. And then they turned to cannibalism. In fact, one day while King Joram was gathered, sitting there in the midst of what would have to have been an antagonizing, defeating moment, a woman came to the king complaining, saying that a woman had, another woman had slighted her. She made her case to the king and she said, on two days ago, myself and another woman made an agreement to kill my child and eat him. And we did that. And the agreement was that I would kill my child on one day and then she would kill her child the next day and we would eat him. But she reneged on the agreement. We ate my child, but then when it was time for her to give up hers, she refused to do it. The king, upon hearing this devastating news, tore his clothes and put ashes on and wore sackcloth and was at a point of mourning and misery and then blamed God and blamed God's prophet Elisha for allowing this to happen. King Joram never looked at himself. It's funny how some people in the midst of situations and circumstances that seem dire that actually come from their own hands often don't look at themselves. They look outward to see where they can blame. King Joram didn't realize that part of what was happening was because he had led the people of God astray. He had begun to worship other, other gods and idols and, and this was the consequences that they were then besieged by their army, the Aramaeans. It's interesting, again, how King Joram lashes out at God and lashes out at Elisha, the prophet. And in fact, the king goes to the prophet's house, Elisha, and tells Elisha that this is your doing. This is God's doing, that we are in these dire straits and no one can get food. And the people are dying and the people are now killing one another and eating one another in order to survive. And he lays the blame at the prophet's feet. The prophet then tells the king something that I'm sure brought some vestige of good news to the king. He tells the king, he says, listen, this time tomorrow, you'll have an abundance of food. So much so that the price of food is going to go all the way down. Because there's so much food, the king's captain, the captain of the guard, made a mockery of Elisha, told him that's impossible. He said, that will never happen. Elisha then looks at the captain of the guards, the king's captain. He said, yes, it will happen. But since you doubt it, you won't eat anything tomorrow. While this is going on, this interaction between the king, Joram, and the prophet Elisha, and the people who are now dying of starvation outside the city gate are four leprous men. You need to understand, in case you don't understand, there's a reason why they're outside the city gate. They're standing between a dying people and a ferocious enemy. They're standing there because they are lepers. And they have been excommunicated. They have been put outside of their familiar spaces, not able to socialize with family, not able to socialize with friends. They have been put outside and prior to the famine, the way the lepers in that moment outside of the city of Samaria were taken care of is that from the city walls, people would throw the garbage over the city walls and the lepers would eat the garbage that people would throw over the city walls. But when there's no food, 
is no garbage. So those four men who are already relegated to the margins of their society, who are already relegated to, the, to, the, to, to eating leftovers, are now standing outside of the city gate and no food is coming from the inside and they are going to die first from leprosy, but now they feel that they're also going to die from starvation in their minds. They have no options. And let me pause for a second. And maybe this little word may speak to somebody here, but isn't it amazing the clarity you get when you have no options? Isn't it amazing sometimes how clearly you can see when you have no options? This is deep because you may not fully grasp this. I, I, I had to go by images and Bible stories until 2017 when we went to India. And I, and I remember that day. And I have to share this because it's a powerful moment. And those of us who went on that trip to India on this particular day, we were going to do ministry in a leper's colony. Now, you don't hear of leprosy in nowadays, but when you're in an in a area in a country stricken by poverty, access to basic medical needs that would no longer make leprosy an issue are not there. We were going and preparing ourselves. Some of you are here. Remember that. We were preparing ourselves to go to the leprous colony. And, 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 and I remember Reverend Lakeisha told folk, if you don't feel comfortable going in this space, if you don't feel comfortable being in the environment, it's okay. No judgment. You can stay on the bus because the pastor we was working with was bringing some uh, food and some blankets to them. But he even warned, don't touch anybody. We got off the bus and we began to make our way. And I remember walking down this little side street, so to speak. And it was a dirt road. But to my right, as we were walking, was the cemetery where they would be buried in. As we turned the corner and we began to come, there were these people sitting down on the ground on these wooden planks, ready for a word. They came for service. And and I had to preach, and, and I could not imagine it. And the minute we stepped, Joyce, you remember, the minute we stepped into the area where the lepers were, swarms of flies just started gathering over us. Here were people who had open sores, missing fingers and sores all over their body, children and women and men, and were sitting there. And in that moment, they were waiting to hear what I had to say. I remember in that moment, I, I told some folk, don't swing at the flies. And I'm telling you, I'm not talking about a handful of flies. I'm talking about the flies were all covering my arm and this arm and all over my face. And I refused to swing because this was their life. And I had to preach with the flies on my face and the flies on my arms and all over my body. And everybody who was there had the same thing. And I could not imagine all of a sudden these stories like this got real for me. Because you could see, you could see here I was preaching a word of life standing between them and their final resting place. You can't imagine how hopeless you feel and they were relegated to this colony, this area because no one wanted to touch them. Not even the pastor and the people from the church who came. But let me tell you how God is and this is not part of the sermon but, but after I preached that day we started praying and everybody in our team moved through those folk and was touching and hugging and praying. <laughs> Nobody got sick. Nothing happened to anybody. But those folk had people who weren't afraid to touch them and to be around them. You can't imagine how empowering that must have felt when even the people who see them regularly did not want to come around them and be near their hair with these strangers from America who were coming in the midst of them and not afraid of their condition. We believed in something else. So when I see this story, I see those people outside the city gate. No one wanting to touch them and no one wanting to be near them. And people were content with giving them their leftovers and their scraps. But a famine was in the land and there was no more food left. And they sat outside the gate and they knew their condition was going to kill them. Death was inevitable. And whether you know it or not, all of us in here have a dying condition. 
Nobody will live forever. All of us will leave this place. And those men decided outside the gate, listen, if we go back in the city, which was really not a possibility because they would not have been welcome, we're going to die. If we stay here, we're going to die. And in that moment, clarity came. Let's take a chance and go into the enemy's camp. And if they receive us, we just might live. But if not, we're going to die anyway. And since we're going to die, let's take a chance and live. I hope you hear that today, beloved. And I won't be before you long, but I hope you get that today. Because your condition may not be leprosy. But you feel like somehow your life is diminishing. And things are not coming together. And in fact, you're in a space where you almost feel like giving up. I ain't talking to everybody today. But I'm talking to the folk who's sitting outside the gates of possibility. And feel as though death is hovering. And it may not be literal, but it just might be literal. But you see life vanquishing right before you. And the issue is not the situation you are in that creates the dire feelings inside. The question is whether or not you die before the actual death. What will you do? Because the truth is... You do have options, even though it seems like possibilities have been cut off and the ways have been cut off. You still have some options in your life. But sometimes when things are so bad, you can't see another way out. And so you just settle into the insane space and settle into the painful place and settle into the damaging place because something within you feels as though there's nothing else for you. Have you ever been in that place where you were about to settle in a dying space? I don't know who I'm talking to today, but, but I'm talking to somebody where you got to a place where you stopped believing that life could get better and you could get better and things could get better. And you at that place where you were about to become content with a place that was actually eating away at who you are. Have you ever been there in that place where you were about to throw in the towel because your eyes had limited vision and you could not see another way of being or living? In fact, you've given so much of yourself to this space that is now killing you. You'd rather die in misery than take a chance and live. I know that feeling when you're ready to surrender to a place that you were not meant to stay in. When you're ready to throw in your hands and throw up your hands and give up to a place that, that you are bigger than. And if you tell the truth, you're better than as well. Have you been there? And no one understands the nature of your misery because you learned the beautiful art of compartmentalizing your pain. And so in public, you perform as though everything is well, but in private, your soul is collapsing and your mind is fading. Have you ever been there where, where you, you felt as though this is the place I'm going to die? Because there's nothing else for me. Have you been there where you resign yourself to an undying misery? Have you been there? That's why I love these four lepers. They looked at the situation, knew they were going to die but refuse to settle in. Why stay here and die? Such a simple question. Also a simple declaration. But for some of us, it takes years to come to the realization. 
For some of us, it takes a long time to get to a point where you actually raise the question, why die here? Because the only way you can begin to raise that question is maybe you got nothing else to lose. I mean, if it's going to be bad and if it's been bad, why not take a chance and see what happens? And I'm talking to somebody here today because then you're at that place where you're seeing some faint possibilities, but you're afraid. But hold on, you're afraid of it not working, but you become content with what is not working. You didn't catch that. You're afraid that the possibilities won't come to pass, but you're also afraid that they haven't been working in this space. You're living between fears and all both fears don't always make sense. I'm fearful because that I'll die in this space, but I'm fearful of leaving the space. Space. Oh, come on. you got to help me here. You're fearful you'll die here, but you're fearful to live here. And sometimes when you get to that point, when you're between these two agonizing fears, something within your soul rises up and says, and even when you can't say it, your soul says it. Can I help you understand something? You know you're at the point of a breakthrough, even though it looks bleak, when your soul starts speaking, when your mouth is silent. i got to help you when your soul starts grieving and agonizing and desiring something else else and your soul says why stay here if we're gonna die let's die on our terms if we're gonna go out let's go out on our terms but don't die in this place and can I tell you your terms does not always mean safety it means you're choosing when you thought you had no choice. And what are you choosing? You're choosing yourself. Oh my God. There's nothing more powerful than to see a liberated soul inspire the individual to choose themselves. When was the last time you chose you? When was the last time you made a decision for you? When was the last time you made a sacrifice for you? When was the last time you did things no matter how many people would be upset, who would feel some kind of way, who would look at you funny, who would talk about you, and you said, I don't care what you say, what you think, this choice is for me. And I got to make that choice. I'm telling somebody here today. I know you're here. When you've been in that space, when you say, I don't care what you think, you ain't living my life and you ain't walking in my shoes and you don't know my pain. And so what I'm going to do is choose me. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm choosing me today. I'm choosing me today. I made choices for me, for other people. I made decisions for other people. I tried to make other people happy. I tried to put a smile on other people's face. Well, I cried myself to sleep every night. No, today I choose me. And when you make that choice for you, you know what it means sometimes? You've got to abandon the places you've been. Oh, God, I hope you hear that today. You've got, to, you got to have a farewell party to the places that have been collapsing your spirit. You've got to say, I can do bad what? All by myself, and I ain't staying here for this. And you've got to tell yourself, self, I can't stay here. God's got more for me. There's more life to live. There's more things to do. There's more places to see. I can't stay here. Look at somebody and tell them I can't stay here. God ain't through with me yet. The book ain't closed. Chapters are still being written. My life is still going on. I can't stay here. Oh, come on, y'all playing today. I can't stay here. I can't stay here. I can't stay here. I've seen God do too much. I've seen too many doors opening, too many ways made, and too many miracles happening, too many breakthroughs. I can't stay here. I got to take a chance and live hold on 
I really want to stop, but I'm going to give you this piece here. Because here it is. The greatest thing you can activate, the one thing you can activate right now is your courage. Can I tell you? You can pray. You can meditate. But when it comes time to break camp and move, you need courage. You got to be able to have courage and trust that if God be for me, oh God, then who can be against me? I'm going to mount wings and fly and leave this space. I can't stay here. My courage. And can I tell you something? When your courage gets activated, it's hard to put it back in your pocket. When your courage starts coming alive, you start blowing your own mind. You start saying things you never thought of, doing things you never did, going places you've never been. When your courage gets activated, all the demons in hell ought to get afraid when you show up. When your courage it's working okay I, I'm, I'm leaving I'm leaving Joyce I'm leaving look look those men get up and go <laughs> they get to the camp and it's eerily quiet they expected opposition but instead, Linnea, they got a clean way with no obstacle. Hold on. Hold on. I, I need to testify for a second, y'all. I'm going to testify for some of y'all. You ever make a courageous decision and you expect it there to be opposition, but you realize that when you took that one step, it clears your enemies out the way. Oh, God. Your enemies didn't realize that the universe is waiting for you to take that one move. And when you made that one step, God started putting stuff in motion that had been on pause until your courage woke up. They get there and... and and there's no Aramean army. Apparently, they heard a sound. Boy, y'all gonna get this. The sound was so loud that it scared the Aramean army, Lena. They thought that there were horses and chariots and they ran. Okay, I'm good. The enemy ran, not because of a weapon, but because of a sound. Oh, God, you missing this. There was no spears, no swords, no horses, a sound. This ain't connect to you yet. I heard Pastor Dez this morning say, we all worship different. But I'm telling you, I need you to make a sound every now and again. You, you ain't, you ain't got to worship like me. But sometimes when you create certain sounds... It'll make your enemies think twice. So you see, praising God ain't about performance. I'm trying to give my enemies advance notice that if you keep trying to come my way, I'm going to start opening my mouth and some stuff going to start shifting. The minute out, is there anybody here today? Look at your neighbor and tell them, neighbor. I need you to make some noise. I, I need you to make a sound. I, I need you to give God praise. I, I need you to holler a little bit. I, I need the enemy to know. Keep on, keep on. That's, that's your enemy leaving and your enemy leaving and your enemy leaving. Keep on making that sound. Here. I'm the guy in the head. Listen. What do they do? The men who had no options took a chance. And it says 
they went in the tent, took all the gold, all the silver, all the clothes, and the food. They were feasting and gathering. Went and hid that stuff. Went back in another tent, took all the gold, took all the silver, took all the clothes, took all the food. And then let me tell you what grace is. Because you need to know, for these four men, there are two sets of enemies. The enemies that look like them and the enemies on the other side. Their very folk left them outside the city, kicked them out of the city, kicked them out of the community. And look what grace looks like. There when there, they were taken care of because people don't realize the way that was made wasn't for the people in Samaria. The way that was made was for the four men that the people kicked out. God routed an entire army for four people. Y'all ain't getting that. And you think God won't move heaven and earth to open doors in your life? Huh? You think you're so insignificant? That God won't kick down some doors and fight your battle? No. While they're there, and I'm done, here's what they say. This is not right. Grace in action. We ought to share this good news. And they go back. I stopped reading there. But... This is to help those folk who were afraid to leave in the first place. You're going to take that chance and you're going to watch God work. But guess what? The folk who kicked you out are going to realize that they really couldn't hurt you. Hold on. You thought you were going to die there. But they don't have the last word on your life. And sometimes you got to tell them, one, thank you for pushing me when I couldn't run myself. For kicking me out when I didn't have sense to stay or to leave rather. Because it just might be that the very folk who did not want you there will be the very folk who will be blessed because you left. Why stay here and die? You got the answer. No, I'm going to live. Whatever that looks like, I'm going to live. I need you to feel that right now. It's those three words. I'm going, well, four words, to live. <laughs> I'm going to live. I'm going to live. It's sometimes that simple. I know sometimes the problems seem complicated and the circumstances seem a little crazy. But it's really a simple decision. I'm going to live. When you say that, you have no idea what is set off in the atmosphere. And then you start really saying things like this. I'm not going to die here. This thing is not going to kill me. I'm not going to lose my mind here. Before I stay, I will mount the courage. I can't stay here. I'm going to live. How many want to live today? Yes. I'm going to live. 
I don't know who you are today, but if you're at the gate trying to figure out your next move, I want you to come down here today. You at the gate trying to figure out what, whether you're going to stay and die or take a chance and live. Because see, you know what's going to happen if you stay. You're clear about that. You've already experienced the death of staying. You already felt death hovering in that space. But maybe you're at that gate and now you're trying to figure out what to do. Here's the word for you today. Take a chance and live. And what motivates that? It's that thought, I'm going to live. I will not die here. I'm going to live. I'm going to live. And, and those of you who've come, let that be a mantra today. Just softly keep repeating it to yourself. Because let that be your prayer. Sometimes you wonder what to say, what is our prayer. What, well, that's your prayer. Simply whisper to yourself right now and keep whispering it to encourage yourself. I'm going to live. Those are the words today. I'm going to live. Come on. Let that noise resound. I'm going to live. Just keep repeating it. Keep repeating it. It's not silly. It's, it's powerful. I'm going to live. I'm going to live. I'm going to to live and then the more you say it the more you see the places where you need to put your emphasis I'm going to live I'm going to live you put the emphasis where it needs to be I'm going to live you don't have to have any fancy words today that's it I'm going to live I'm going to live I'm going to live Dante, give me a little bit of that. Is he near? God, we thank you today and we love you today, oh God. God, we are so grateful for this moment, for this day, and for your word. God, some of us have been sitting outside the gate for a long time, not sure what to do, afraid of dying, but afraid to leave. God, thank you for reminding us that we do have options. We can take a chance and live. We can go and see what's there without fear, but full of courage. God, the truth is all of us have seen you work in our lives in different ways. And so we're not going on nothing. We're not taking a chance on nothing. We've seen you work, God. We have testimonies and a history and a story with you, oh God. And so God, I lift those before you now, O oh God, who like those four lepers are outside the gate trying to figure out what to do. Remind them how strong they are, O oh God. Remind them how courageous they are, O oh God. Remind them of their confidence. Remind them, O oh God, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And most of all, O oh God, let them know that everything will be all right. And all they got to do is take a chance and live. God, thank you for pouring into us today, oh God. Thank you for reminding us, oh God, of your never-ending presence. Thank you for reminding us, oh God, that sometimes we just have to take that first move and then watch things start opening up in our lives. And the truth is, oh God, we can't imagine what's waiting for us on the other side of our courage, on the other side of our faith, on the other side of our confidence. But God, we do know this. If we stay where we are, we will die. So we're going to take a chance and live. God, pour out your spirit on everybody who's come down today. Pour out your spirit. Oh God, pour out your spirit, oh God, on everyone who has come. Pour out your spirit, oh God. Fill their hearts and their minds with your love and your grace.
God, we thank you. God, we love you. God, we love you. We've been through too much not to worship you, oh God. We've been through too much not to give you glory. We've been through too much not to praise your name. And we've been through, oh God, and our presence here today is a testimony that we've survived 100% of our worst days. So God, we bless your name today. We thank you. We lift this prayer. In your name we pray. And we say amen. 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 Come on, give the Lord a hand kind of praise on today.